Good evening, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome uh, to our Bloomberg European headquarters. My name is Elizabeth Drummond, and I am the manager of government affairs for Bloomberg in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Tonight, we're very pleased to host you for the Center for Policy Studies uh, Keith uh, Joseph Memorial Lecture. I hope I got that right, of course. Um, and uh, we are, we're very happy to be hosting this. We're a firm believer in convening um, our policymakers for very important discussions on timely topics of the day. So without any further ado, please allow me to introduce uh, Lord Saatchi. Good evening, everyone. Friends of the CPS, uh, great pleasure to see you all. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, thank you very much. I must first thank, perhaps we would all thank, Bloomberg for staging this lecture and Liz for organizing it all. The um, CPS established the Keith Joseph Memorial Lecture exactly 20 years ago. And since then, it has become a, a most important part of the CPS calendar and has so far been addressed by three um, sitting prime ministers. And tonight, it will be addressed by um, a man who may be a uh, sitting <laughs> prime minister. We hope he will. Um, I'd like to... I'd like to say right away that it is a tremendous honor for all of us to see the um, Keith Joseph family here. Um, Keith Joseph's daughters have attended all of these lectures over the years. And if I may um, ask you to, to applaud Keith Joseph's um, family, um, his wife and his beautiful daughters, and his grandson, Anthony, who is going to be here in a few minutes. Would you? Uh, in, this, in this lecture tonight, which I've read and I think is uh, absolutely marvellous, and I know you're going to enjoy it very much, uh, Matthew Hancock is going to follow uh, a line, correctly and wisely, but also brilliantly, taken by the Prime Minister earlier this week at a, at a gathering. Matthew Hancock, as you know, has had um, the sort of rise through the political ranks, which is um, remarkable. He only arrived in the Palace of Westminster in 2010. And uh, when I first met him, he was chief of staff to, the, to George Osborne and um, has then recently been appointed to the cabinet and is now, as you know, the uh, minister for the cabinet office um, and has taken on tremendous responsibilities inside the government. And we are at the CPS. We are very proud of what he's achieved. I was sure the first time I heard him speak that um, this boy is going all the way, and I'm sure he, I'm sure he will. The, to, to just reflect on what I was just saying, Matt's speech follows what the Prime Minister said uh, on Monday at a, at a gathering. He said that he hoped that the EU referendum would be finished soon, in just a few days' time, and that then he would have an opportunity to do what he wants to do with his government, which is to um, try to make a reality out of the conservative dream, the CPS dream, Keith Joseph's dream of um, aspiration, uh, ambition, independence, freedom, self-determination, all the things that Keith Joseph, Margaret Thatcher, and David Cameron himself stand for. And he went on to say to us, the Prime Minister, that the, the mechanism by which all this would stop being a dream and could become a reality, this Tory vision, was technology. And that technology could release people and give people more freedom to advance and achieve what they wanted to achieve in their lives. Well, Matthew Hancock is responsible for the government's approach to technology and to achieve those great aims. And it's that that Matt is going to talk to us about this evening. So, may I introduce Matthew Hancock? Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed for that uh, very kind and um, uh, only slightly exaggerated uh, introduction. Uh, it's a huge honour to be here to deliver the Keith Joseph Memorial Lecture and a particular privilege that several members of the Joseph family are here tonight. My generation can't remember 
the Britain that existed before the revolution that was born by Sir Keith. And my view is that we owe him a great debt of thanks. But my generation is now having to refight battles that we all, frankly, thought that Sir Keith had won. Keith Joseph was clear-sighted in analysing the problems of his time, rigorous in the pursuit of his solutions, and one of today's great challenges uh, that needs his sort of rigour, frankly, is the disruptive rise of new technology. So today I want to ask how he would have approached this rise of technology and what my generation must do to rise to that challenge. Let's start with the story. 15 years ago, the video rental company Blockbuster was at the height of its powers. It had 60,000 employees and 9,000 outlets worldwide. It dominated its market almost as completely as the Roman Empire dominated the Mediterranean in the time of Hadrian. Back then, the famous blocky yellow font could be seen on every high street in every town across Britain. But, like the Romans, the decline proved just as irreversible. In 2010, Blockbuster filed for bankruptcy. Shops were boarded up. Thousands lost their jobs. And their fate had been sealed when Blockbuster refused to move with the times. When the founder of a little-known tech startup arrived at Blockbuster's giant HQ in Dallas with a business proposal, he was offering to run their brand online. And apparently, he was laughed out of the boardroom. But today, that little-known startup, Netflix, has 80 million subscribers, including me, and nobody is laughing at Netflix now. This story of disruption has repeated in different forms with different protagonists the world over, yet the underlying plot remains the same. An entrepreneur uses new technology to disrupt an established business model, offering consumers a better, faster, cheaper, and more convenient service. The disruptor rakes in billions. Consumers benefit but the disrupted lose their livelihoods. And those old jobs are often gone forever. Netflix employs just 3,500 people worldwide. So tonight, I want to address two big questions that come from this. First, is disruption a good thing? Is the overall picture one of innovation and rising prosperity or dislocation and growing insecurity? And then the second, which flows from the first, and it's the oldest question in conservative politics. What, if any, is the role for government? What place for lumbering Leviathan in a world that gets faster and more interconnected every year? And I think that it is vital that we answer these questions, both so that we can govern well, but also because ideas we thought Sir Keith had long vanquished are back on the agenda. And this is a battle of ideas that we've got to win. In recent times, two political tendencies have grown strong by feeding on the anger and the anxiety of the disrupted. There's the populist right, Trump, Farage, Le Pen, angry nativists who want to ward off the world. Then there's the populist left, Corbyn, McDonald, Sanders, unreconstructed socialists who've learned nothing from the mistakes of history. Both sides reject open markets. Both are obsessed with creating a better yesterday. Their political program amounts to a demand that things go back to the way they were, to the spirit of 45, or les trente glorieuses, or the glory days of the American past. Both seek false certainties. They're reactionaries. So we, in the, as conservatives, need to preserve the best of the past and the best of the new, and seek security and opportunity based on a hard-headed analysis of this complex world. So this reactionary socialism on the far left and the closed minds of the reactionary right would unlearn these hard-won lessons of how to build a prosperous and dignified society, and they must be resisted. And instead, I believe that a big opportunity awaits those who can provide an optimistic, open, forward-looking agenda engaged in the world while resolutely focused on engaging people in what they want in life, 
a satisfying job, a loving relationship, a caring family, a good home, and a safety net when they need it, where their children can do better than they do, where anyone, anyone, can by rights go as far as their talents and efforts can take them, irrespective of background, and where we know and acknowledge that change is hard and people deserve a helping hand through it. That is the modern conservatism that we must offer. So let's ask directly these two big questions. First, should we be afraid of disruption? Since Keith Joseph's death 20 years ago, the global economy has changed profoundly. Back then, a third of the world survived on less than $2 a day. Just a billion people earned enough money to make any discretionary payments at all. China's economy was smaller than Italy's 20 years on, in part because of what he did and what he stood for, that extreme poverty has more than halved. The global middle class has doubled to over 2 billion. And China creates an Italian-sized economy every 18 months. The explanation for that growth? A massive expansion of the free market twinned with mass deployment of new technology. And it's impossible to separate these forces since both complement and catalyze each other. Technology has opened up more avenues for trade, if you think about refrigeration and pasteurization and mass transit and bulk shipping and click and collect. And at the same time, markets have refined and diffused this use of technology. And the result is that as a world, on all objective measures, we are getting richer, we're getting healthier, we're getting less hungry, we're getting taller, although not each of us personally, and we're getting in more interconnected. Yet despite all of this, many suggest that we've hit the end of the road of living standards rising. There seems to be some kind of received wisdom that despite all this technology, we live in an age of stagnation, that our children won't be as prosperous as our parents, and that technology is somehow making everything worse. It's a belief that's quite popular in some academic circles. It's espoused by some Nobel Prize winning economists and by politicians of both left and right. Now, one of Keith Joseph's great talents was to face up to flawed assumptions and to be a warrior against a lazy consensus. In his day, the received wisdom was that inflation was unmanageable, the trade unions ungovernable, and Britain's best days lay behind her and he tackled those received wisdoms head on. So now it's for us to do the same. Let's tackle this modern day pessimism that technological progress is bad news. We can start with its internal contradiction. Some say that the pace of innovation has slowed, that we're living in a world of diminishing technological returns to production. This is the thesis of a book by Professor Robert Gordon that's very fashionable in academic circles right now. Others say, that new general purpose technology is destroying good jobs faster than they can be replaced. You may have heard that argument. They can't both be right. Do we have a problem of too much disruptive technology or too little? Are we stuck in the Middle Ages or are we hurtling towards a dystopian future? Has innovation lost its momentum? The first of these arguments. Well, Professor Gordon argues that we came up with all the revolutionary inventions during what he calls the second industrial revolution from 1870 to the post-war boom. Things like um, electric lighting, uh, the internal combustion engine. These things were, he says, transformational, but now the advances are only sort of incremental. To paraphrase, instead of making the jump from the telegraph to the telephone, um, we're just building slimmer phones. As a result, he claims, young Americans will be the first in their history not to exceed their parents' standard of living. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear this, it reminds me of um, what William Priest said. William Priest was the chief engineer at the British Post Office in the 1890s. Um, he was an expert in the telegraph, and he couldn't see the point of the telephone. And he dismissed it, saying, we have plenty of messenger boys. But he wasn't alone. Um, unworthy of the attention of practical and scientific men was the conclusion of a parliamentary select committee set up to investigate Edison's light bulb. I'm quite glad that the uh, accuracy of select committee reporting has increased since then. Um, 
we have reached the limits of what is possible with computers, said John Van Neumann in 1949. He was a pioneering computer scientist. Even our heroes sometimes make mistakes, we've got to admit it. Sir Keith once visited a high-tech factory when he was industry secretary, and he asked one of the directors, do you think television has really come to stay? <laughs> well, maybe with the advance of Netflix, he was ahead of his time. Uh, but now, for the first time in history, we've reached a point where machines can do the cognitive as well as the physical labor, the thinking as well as the doing. And this affects almost everything. Uh, let's take cars. Professor Gordon says they accomplished basically the same role of transporting people from A to B as they did in 1970, just a bit more convenient and a bit more safely. But this misses a vital detail. Computers are now learning to drive. Driverless cars promise a new revolution. You can work in them en route. They reduce emissions and traffic, make journey times shorter. They give disabled people far greater mobility. And the vast majority of accidents are caused by human error, so they promise to cut road deaths too. For the average British family, their car is their second biggest investment, but they're only used 4% of the time. What a massive waste of resources. All this investment lined up by the side of the road, hardly being used. Should driverless cars become ubiquitous, families can then spend their savings on something far more useful than a steel box that spends most of its life sat on the driveway. So everywhere we turn, digital technology is driving improvements in almost every sphere of life. 3D printers, printing jet engine components, sensors in concrete that report on its structural integrity, from smart traffic planning to dynamic energy demand. The fact is we're just in the foothills of a new technological revolution that will do even more to lift living standards and improve the human condition. But Professor Gordon's hard evidence for the loss of momentum is the data on productivity. And here, for those of us who are optimists, we need an answer. Because the data does show that, that a slowing in productivity coincides with the rise of the internet. My response is that we need better measurement because the current measures are broken. It may surprise you, but we don't measure productivity directly. We essentially take measured GDP and divide it by the total number of hours worked. Now, GDP matters. It's the sum total of all the income that our economy creates. It's the best measure we've got of people's living standards. But this way of measuring it was designed in the middle of the last century to capture exactly the sorts of things that were being made then, cars and fridges and widgets of all kinds. And it suits the economy of the second industrial revolution because it's the product of that revolution. For decades, this didn't really matter. The economy was all about widgets, but now it's about digits. And this matters because the theory, this matters in theory because digital is breaking down this binary distinction between consumption and production that much of economics has been built on since the days of Adam Smith. While much process and progress in the last two centuries was based on separating consumption and production in pursuit of efficiency. We all know about the division of labor and the pin factory. Much of what gets produced in digital form today is done at zero marginal cost to the producer and zero cost to the consumer. And in the act of consuming a digital service, which we all do, we're also producing because much of the digital economy runs on the user data that we provide. In the information age, these zero marginal costs fundamentally change the economy. Now, I don't know what all the conclusions of this change will be, but it is a big challenge to the economics profession. And it matters hugely, not just in theory, but in practice. Because many of the benefits of technological advance don't get picked up in traditional measures of GDP. Let's take an example. A few years ago, we in government released TFL travel data as open data, free for anyone to access and reuse. Then along came CityMapper to use the data to build an app to tell you whether it's quicker to walk or take the tube when you go home on a rainy evening like this. Not only that, it tells you how many calories you'll burn in the process, and surely that represents an improvement in people's well-being and their quality of life. 
not according to GDP as measured. The enjoyment of the walk compared to the sweaty compression of the tube, not measured. The health benefits, not included. The improvement to the environment, no. The time save, nada. In fact, the only way that decision troubles the scorers is that the cost of your tube ticket no longer counts as economic activity, so GDP is lower. Productivity, as measured, is lower, and we are, according to the statisticians, worse off. And the failure of GDP to capture the consumer side of life, the environmental or health benefits, for instance, isn't new. Although, in the past, these impacts were often mostly negative. For instance, when a factory opened and there was more pollution, whereas now they're often positive. But the failure of the GDP to measure economic impact accurately and not even to get the direction of the impact on GDP right, this is on a completely new scale because of technology. And it's not just CityMapper. The watch that reminds you to take your medicines, if you order your weekly shop online, sharing your pictures of your family, even though you're a continent away, these all have no impact on measured GDP, but they enrich our lives immensely. And what about the money saved from online home swap? The app that saves energy, how about the time and cost saved when you make a money transfer on an app on your phone for free? These changes formally reduce existing measures of GDP and therefore productivity. Yet these are the innovations of our time. One recent American study found that the gains associated with this sort of free consumption was the equivalent of three quarters of a percentage point in growth to GDP each year. Now fortunately here in the ONS, um, here in the UK, the ONS recognized these problems. We're lucky to have one of the best statistical agencies in the world to rise to this challenge of measuring the modern economy. Um, and there are some very big questions for them to answer on the nature of the value consumers receive from digital services and how the sharing economy fits in. So my response to these naysayers, to Professor Gordon, is clear. Progress hasn't faltered. Progress marches on. And now let's look at this second hypothesis. What if the robots are coming for our jobs? Let me take you to George Eliot's Middlemarch. It was set in 1832. A riot nearly breaks out when engineers from London come to survey the parish for the construction of a railway. There's no knowing what there is at the bottom of it, says one suspicious local, and it's to do harm to the land and the poor man in the long run. Some things will never change. And this sums up this second hypothesis, that innovation's happening, yes, but it'll, it'll benefit some, but that everybody else is going to lose out. It's not a new concern, and I'm afraid I have an admission to make. 200 years ago in Nottinghamshire, there was a large cottage industry of wool knitting. Then Richard Arkwright came along, and he invented the water frame, and the Luddites organized riots in protest. In 1812, a 1,000 people met up near Arnold, outside Nottingham, to smash up the frames. The riots was, uh, were only stopped when a troop of dragoons came by and arrested the ringleader. The Luddites were protesting against the effects of the inevitable march of technology. And what was the name of the Luddites' leader, Benjamin Hancock? Fast forward to 1933, then it was John Maynard Keynes, worried about the new disease of technological unemployment. In 1963, it was Harold Wilson telling the Labour Party conference that technological progress would lead to a high rate of employment for a few and to mass redundancies for the many. Every time we enter a downturn and unemployment rises, people point their fingers at the robots of the day. And my argument is that blaming technology is a mistake. Today, we're recovering from a deep cyclical downturn, not just an ordinary demand-led recession, but a debt crisis. As Reinhard Rogoff's History of Financial Crises shows, after a systemic banking crisis, it takes on average eight years to reach pre-crisis levels of income. It took the UK seven years to do this after the 2008 crash. So there's nothing to suggest that this time is different. 
that Great Recession is now thankfully abating, and we've got a job-rich recovery, which I, unlike some pessimists like Paul Krugman, think is unambiguously a good thing. And likewise, on pay, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, real wages stagnated. But the good news is that here in the UK, they're rising again, and there's no evidence of permanent stagnation. There is, though, of course, a debate about the labour share, the amount of our national income that's paid out in wages. I am firmly of the school of thought that holds that the purpose of growth, of economic growth, is better pay. So we should bend policies towards pay rises. So where in the last parliament we made huge progress on the quantity of jobs, now we must make further progress on the, the quality, whether it's ensuring shareholders can express a view on executive pay, which we did in the last parliament, or introducing the national living wage, which we've done in this parliament. Here I probably differ from many conservatives of a generation ago. But where a generation ago the challenge was the unaccountable power of trade unions, now the labour share is at historic lows and we want to ensure everyone benefits from economic recovery and the benefits of growth are spread fairly. Here too, as with jobs, the right approach, with the right approach, technology can be our ally in the drive for higher pay. But these techno-pessimists continue to forecast a future in which the, the, the average human being is obsolete. They, those who only see the job losses have fallen for a classic lump of labour fallacy. As Keith Joseph put it himself, the history of the last 200 years, packed as it is with labour-saving inventions, demonstrates this error. And once again, he was right. There isn't a static stock of jobs which, dis if destroyed, reduces employment. People are dynamic. Technology boosts productivity. It cuts costs. It allows people to spend money on other things. And that creates new jobs. The jobs our forebears did 100 years ago were vastly different to the ones that we do today. My great-grandfather was a Nottinghamshire miner. When he was in his prime in the 1920s, over a million people worked in coal mines deep underground. Now there are none. Last year, there were 20,000 fewer personal assistants and secretaries than in 2001. Thinking ahead, there's still a million jobs in call centers and 200,000 checkout operators. But for how long? Carl Frey and Michael Osborne, two academics working at the uh, University of Oxford, they estimate that 35% of UK jobs are at risk of automation. But for every period of unprecedented automation, the pessimists have predicted mass unemployment, technological advancement has never failed to deliver new opportunities, and the same is true today. Employment rates are at record highs, whole occupations exist that didn't 20 years ago, and in the future, Machines will do a lot of the things that are currently done by humans. If we get this right, the technology will free us up to do jobs that only we humans can. Uh, jobs that involve problem solving, creativity, social intelligence, for instance, coming up with new business ideas, writing thrilling books, making scientific breakthroughs, caring for one another, teaching one another, motivating one another. We should automate work and humanize jobs. We should give the mundane to the machines and purpose back to people. And causing this technological unemployment isn't the only charge levelled at the disruptors. They're also accused of being the driving force behind unacceptable levels of inequality. So I want to ask this question. Is technology creating an undeserving rich? For conservatives who believe in social mobility, this is a serious issue because it's no good creating a fantastically productive and sophisticated economy if only too few can enjoy it and the rest are consigned to the scrap heap. Some argue that digital technology has an inherent tendency to concentrate wealth and market power. This is because of a digital, the value of a digital network increases the more people join. So simply put, the more people who sign on to Facebook, the more use it is to everybody. So many digital services are dominated by a few giant platforms, Google for searching, Amazon and Alibaba for retail, Uber for minicabs, and the owners of these platforms can make a fortune. And we've seen vast fortunes made, but these platforms have another crucial characteristic. They create new markets so millions or billions of other people can improve their lives. And indeed, Professor William Nordhaus has suggested that only 2% of social value of innovation is captured 
by the innovators themselves. The PhD student who drives an Uber part-time to fund a course, the family-run business um, that uses Just Eat to grow their takeaway brand, the retired couple who supplement their pension trading on eBay, these people all benefit from the new platforms and the new markets they create. And what's more, by replacing mundane jobs, technology can enhance social mobility too. After all, ultimately, it is technology that allows us to be more prosperous than our parents and grandparents. I say that more difficult and dangerous work, that c the more difficult, dangerous work that can be done by the machines, the better. Now, some argue that the real truth here is more brutal, that we can't all rise, that for every poor person who climbs, another must fall. So who's right? I know which view Keith Joseph would have supported. He would have pointed out that just as free markets and technology mean people as a whole are more prosperous than at any time in the course of human history, so these same forces mean the overall direction of social mobility is upwards. He would, in other words, have argued that as well as the lump of labour fallacy, there is a lump of advantage fallacy. As humanity becomes wealthier through technology, as work is automated and jobs are humanised, all can rise. Now, there's an important critique here, because, of course, there can only be one Lord Chief Justice or Chief Executive of Rolls-Royce or, um, thanks, uh, Lord Saatchi, Prime Minister. But if we get this right, there will be more of those interesting, rewarding and stimulating jobs and a higher proportion of the workforce in them. In short, we shouldn't think of social mobility as relative to our peers. That is the politics of envy. We should think of social mobility as relative to our forebears, because that is the politics of progress. But social mobility isn't automatic. It doesn't happen without effort. So while it's wrong to discriminate against anyone because of their background, it is right to take measures and to measure how effectively people can access the top. And I want to take the specific example of entry into the civil service, which has been in the news recently. A lot of ink has been spilled over the last couple of weeks about our approach to broadening access to the civil service. Some have accused me of fomenting a class war. Others have called me suicidally brave. So I want to set out exactly what we are and are not planning to do. Recent evidence suggests that the fast stream is less socially diverse than Oxbridge. And it's true that too little effort has gone into finding talent from all parts of the country and all backgrounds. This is much broader than the school you attended. I'm a product of and a proud supporter of Britain's independent schools. I'm about as far from a class warrior as you can get. But the civil service is not drawing on all the talents that it could. And unlike gender or ethnicity, for example, this isn't normally measured. Over the past few years, we've put a huge amount of effort into broadening this access to the civil service. Our apprenticeship schemes bring in talent from completely new backgrounds. We've expanded outreach to encourage people to apply more broadly. We're making recruitment processes less London-centric. We want to measure overall how successful these policies are. Any background measures will be collected on an entirely voluntary basis and used anonymously. And let me be absolutely clear, they will not form the basis of any individual recruitment decision because when it comes to appointment, that is and should always be on merit. Positive action, yes. Positive discrimination, no. And in fact, we're going further to remove discrimination. Some have suggested that the best way to tackle this is anonymous applications, and they are exactly right. Since September, we've ensured that applications are both name blind and school blind. This now covers 70% of the civil service by default and soon will be standard across the board. And it's part of a wider plan to remove bias in people's applications. And just like the success we've had in radically increasing the number of women on boards, this meritocracy can only be promoted by eschewing quotas and sticking rigorously to appointment on merit while measuring how well we do in giving everyone a fair chance to serve their country. So, it's my core belief that technology enhances opportunity and upward social mobility. But we shouldn't be blind to the challenges of getting there. So given all this, let me finally turn to what is the role for government.
Keith Joseph spoke eloquently of a conservatism that emphasizes security, stability, the human urge to form loving bonds with family and community. But this has never been wholly reconciled with the demands of the free market. Sometimes developed economies, including the UK, have historically not done enough to support those who lose their jobs to economic disruption, especially when the losses have come in highly concentrated geographic areas, meaning whole towns and industries have closed virtually overnight. Luddite may now be a byword for backwardness, but the original Luddites were skilled workers with families to feed who'd seen the value of lifetime, a lifetime's craftsmanship vanish overnight and who had no legitimate democratic power to protest. I thought you'd never, but you never thought you'd get a defense of Luddites at a Keith Joseph Memorial Lecture. We've got to remember that for all the benefits that driverless technology will bring, it is not much good if you're a truck driver. So how do we get to this future without leaving anyone behind? And for a modern, compassionate conservative, it is a vital question that we must answer. We must support the disruptors and the disrupted. So the first thing is supporting the disruptors. It's not just about Silicon Valley. Huge efforts have been gone into in the last six years to create a dynamic environment for enterprise in which people's talents and passions can be unleashed. We're incredibly proud that we're home to the fastest growing tech cluster in Europe, that we're embracing shared economy platforms like Uber and Airbnb and Love Home Swap, that we do more e-commerce per head than any other nation, and that, our, and that other governments are using the code written by our very own government digital service. Of course, technology sometimes has its frustrations, as I've discovered myself in the last 24 hours, and any of you may have done if you tried to register to vote after 10.15 last night. But it's the flexibility of an economy that allows people to make the most out of new technologies that are available. By contrast, the left are currently fixated with an idea that's espoused by uh, Mariana Mazzucato that government itself is the best disruptive innovator. And it's true that some things that are in your smartphone, like GPS uh, and some parts of the internet and even Siri, began life as a DARPA research project in the States. Yet no one at the Pentagon dreamed that one day this Cold War era military hardware will be used for online shopping. That required a market. And yes, there's a vital role for government in scientific research, but only as part of a dynamic economy that can take that research to market. Likewise, we need a regulatory framework that stays up to speed with new technologies and ensures a new level playing field. We need a business environment and competition policy in which disruptors can themselves then be disrupted, that's pro-market, not pro-incumbent, and where businesses can arrive and thrive and fail to survive. It means relentlessly tackling barriers to entry, like licenses and restrictive practices and monopolies, while pursuing smart deregulation so businesses aren't crippled with bureaucracy and consumers are protected. And it means lower corporation tax to encourage businesses to expand. It means, develop, it means new, allowing for new platforms to be developed. Uh, let me give you one example. Care work is a difficult and low paid and incredibly important job that's so far been largely untouched by the digital revolution. It can't be done by machines. But how about a platform that allows local authorities with appropriate safeguards to get services directly from care workers that would cut out the huge agency fees and allow direct user feedback from families. Another way the government can support disruption is to release the data that it holds on behalf of the country. So where we've published our data in the open in a usable format, entrepreneurs and academics and pioneering local authorities can then make or find applications for it that we just couldn't imagine in government. Travel apps, property valuations, flood modeling, footfall simulations, they're all, they're, this is just a fraction of the use and the applications of this open data. And so far we've released 29,000 data sets and counting, we're world leaders. There's a blossoming data economy to show for it, but there's much more to do. These are the sorts of things that an active government needs to do. So we've got to support the disruptors. Second, 
Supporting both disruptors and the disrupted demands the right skills. The quality of schools is, of course, critical. And they've got to produce rounded, dynamic, entrepreneurial young people prepared to adapt to this ever-changing world. We need to think of digital skills as foundational alongside English and maths and continue the massive expansion of apprenticeships. But we must stop thinking of education as ending at 18 or 21. Constant learning is the norm. And we've got to do much more to harness education technology to expand the options for adults and children alike. That's the second thing. And third, we must support those who are disrupted too. True conservatism has always rejected laissez-faire. After all, the purpose of a strong and flexible economy is to support people. Where job losses from automation are dispersed and among people with transferable skills, the challenge isn't that great. But where a big change hits an area with a high concentration of jobs in one place, then we've got to be prepared to intervene. The benefits of technological progress are well worth the cost of government intervention to support the disrupted. Over the past few years, I think that governments developed quite a good toolkit for helping manage communities through this sort of disruption. Uh, in 2011, Pfizer decided to close uh, its sandwich site, um, a, a huge pharmaceutical site in Kent. Uh, and the government stepped in. We created an enterprise zone. We lowered business rates. We brought in things like super fast broadband. Um, and the result is that now there are a huge number of entrepreneurial businesses on that site. In 2012, when Ford shut their production plant in Southampton, we worked to redeploy workers who were out of a job, and two years later, less than 2% were out of work. We're now working intensively to save the Port Talbot steelworks. And for those who say we shouldn't have industrial strategies, my answer is clear. Government has an imprint on the economy just by existing, so let's be strategic about that imprint and not passive. Geography matters too. Increasing agglomeration, like with the Northern Powerhouse, improving transport and economic ties, these all reduce the impact of any given shock. And balancing the proven value of clusters with the need to avoid wherever, um, wherever possible isolated industries, this is important. So ultimately, we've got to help businesses create jobs, not just in general, but specifically in the places that need them. And all this means the government rolling up its sleeves, getting its hands dirty to regenerate and attract businesses where jobs have been lost. Look at the Orgreave Colliery, derelict for years after the mine closed. But now, thanks largely to our work in the last parliament, it's a cutting edge catapult combining business, government and academic research. The attitude to the rise of self-employment is also important. Now, there's some on the left who see self-employment as a problem. By contrast, I think it brings flexibility and dynamism. This is the way that a modern, dynamic, free economy works. Freeing disruptors to expand, helping the disrupted where needs demand, supporting people to change, not supporting them to stay the same. Sir Keith spent his life in a battle of ideas in pursuit of a free society that worked for its citizens. He believed, as he put it, in government as a maker of rules who, uh, for men who want to fashion their lives for themselves. Today we must remake those rules, drawing inspiration from and learning from the past, recognizing that technology is not an enemy of humanity, but a collective expression of humanity. We have a duty to win this battle against the reactionaries of left and right. We need to be on the side of the disrupted as well as the disruptors. Throughout history, it's been the role of the conservatives to trust in the ingenuity of the human spirit, to put forward ideas that prepare the world best for the future. Now, my generation must win that battle of ideas once again. There is a lot at stake but the prize is worth it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt, very much indeed for such a marvellous speech. Matt has agreed to answer a handful of questions, so if we can have one over here. 
Yep. Hi, um, Jeff Barry from the Civil Service World. Uh, unsurprisingly, I have a question about the civil service. Uh, you mentioned the government's digital service, the Angel of Speech, and I was just wondering, uh, Stephen Fortier, the DGS director, said last month that officials with digital data and technology skills could fit outside of the traditional civil service rating system in a bid to attract Um, I think that it is important right across the board, including in the civil service, to make sure that we face up to reality, and reality is that digital skills, in part because of all of this, are in huge demand, as are um, the commercial skills, uh, where we're already taking that approach in the civil service. And I would say that our attitude to how government operates in this world must be a reflection of how the rest of the world operates too. Um, and if you want to run a government as effectively as possible, it's got to stay ahead of this digital revolution, and it can only stay ahead of this digital revolution if we can attract brilliant people to work in it. And we've, in, in order to do that, we have to recognise uh, just how much those talents are rewarded outside. Uh, so I, I, I think this is a very important area and we need to make sure that we keep the digital advance going inside government as well as outside. Uh, yes, the question just here. There's a mic just coming. So it's Oliver Latham from CRA. So one of the reasons why these disruptive innovators can grow is because they're sort of outside the existing regulatory framework. And you, you mentioned this in the talk, but yeah. You, you've obviously got a choice as government whether to kind of level the playing field down and kind of soften the regulation on the incumbent or to kind of level up and, and, and place more regulation on the entrant. And, and how do you decide that? I mean, what are, what are yeah. the principles you yeah. use to decide which one to do? Well, the key word in your question is level. So we've got to aim for a level playing field. I've found that in government, many of the regulations that govern businesses in this sort of space were written before the digital revolution um, was even around. Um, and our aim must be for a level playing field. In some cases, that means trying to reduce the regulatory burden uh, on everybody. Uh, and I'm all in favor of that, where that can be done reasonably. Um, in some cases, it's trying to make sure that there is an appropriate regulatory structure. If you take um, uh, crowdfunded finance, for example, um, it, it don't, it's only existed for a few years. Um, and the FCA has put together a framework around it. Uh, and actually, most companies in that space welcome the fact there's a framework. But if that framework was written wrong or was clunky, um, then that would be a bad thing. So you've got to aim at a level playing field, um, but you've got to be prepared to change to make sure that you support uh, these, these new innovations um, and make sure that they don't get uh, stuck in regulations that weren't designed for them, all with a regulator approach which, it, which attempts to be as light touch and unburdensome as possible, because ultimately, most businesses are, uh, exist in order to solve other people's problems. Uh, if you don't solve other people's problems, you're never going to be a very good business. Uh, and therefore, most businesses are a force for good in society. Uh, they create wealth and jobs, and that's why we need to support them rather than regulate them out of existence. A question over here. Would you like to ask a question? Oh, sorry, I the it is. <laughs> uh, thanks for your speech. I uh, enjoyed that greatly. Um, I'm Ollie Smith. I'm a reporter for CityWire, and one of our key audiences is IFAs and asset managers, and many of whom are concerned about the rise of uh, so-called robo-advice and technological solutions that help investors, you know, young and old, to invest their money. I was wondering what, what, what thoughts you had on that and, and whether you wanted to offer any reassurance to that audience or, or, or what? Well, uh, what I'd say is that um, we humans are going to be around for a long, long time. Uh, and there's going to be a role for humans throughout, um, uh, throughout the future. Um, and the reason is because it's, it's we who create this technology. Um, and 
therefore, um, we need to also um, use it. But that means that we've got to change as the technology develops and change what we do. Um, but there's always, this is why I come to this, I use this phrase, we must automate work and humanize jobs. There is a human dimension to many jobs. And increasingly, um, we will see automation in many areas, in, as I said, in cognitive as well as manual uh, areas. Um, and the job of the human beings is to add the human dimension that machines can't uh, deliver on. So my, my, my response would be to harness the technology um, uh, rather than to stand in its way because the, 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 the march of technology is inevitable. There's one just there. Mike's just coming. Thank you. Uh, Nick Snorbin. I think, Matthew, what you've done, you've, you've outlined essentially what a democratic party like the Conservatives, how we should respond to this challenge by taking care of those who are disrupted as well as advancing the cause of the disruptors. But what about those economies on the other side of the world who are more ruthless, who are authoritarian, and don't have to care about the disrupted, partly because there are fewer of them because their economies are still emerging, and partly because they simply don't care? Does that create a real problem in the future? Do they have an advantage over us in, taking, in, in employing the new technology? Well, I don't think they have an advantage if they take that approach. Um, because ultimately you've got to think about what the goal is. And the goal here is to improve the lot of the humans in any country. Um, and, um, uh, and, and sometimes economics is, is talked about in the abstract, forgetting that the purpose of a strong economy is to improve the well-being and the standard of living of the people who live in it. Um, so I, 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 think that the, um, I think there is, of course, an international, uh, an international challenge, but most of these, the countries that take that sort of approach are not nearly as developed as we are now. Um, and although they may be catching up, as they catch up, I wouldn't be surprised if their uh, leadership um, uh, realized the need to ensure that their growth um, leads to the benefit of all in the same way, in, in the same way that we take that attitude. Um, and ultimately, I don't see the development of um, and the growth of the developing world uh, as, uh, as an either or. Um, the cake is getting bigger because of this massive expansion of the free market uh, around the world over the last over my lifetime, um, and um, uh, 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 and so that we, there's more to share all round. So long as we stay on the side of uh, openness and uh, free markets and an approach that allows people to generate that wealth and continue to to build those economies. Yes, there's a question right over here. Oh, you've got the mic. Nick. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Um, and uh, I'm uh, from Imperial College, which is expanding rapidly, but also a director of a care business, uh, Sussex Healthcare, which runs 25 care centres. And I would strongly support what you say about the uh, potential for uh, uh, digital communication to help in the care business but there's only one missing element in, in what you say and that is quality what we need is to use digital for to, to drive the sort of depth of communication and knowledge of the field which produces really good care there, there's I think not enough emphasis in the UK on hidden champions companies that develop a great expertise in a particular field which actually is independent of technology but the technology helps to do it. So uh, perhaps the word quality should come into the next edition of your excellent speech. Uh, well, thank you, Nick. Um, all I'd say to that is um, um, one of the most important things, um, I think, in terms of uh, being in government and being a politician uh, is realising that most of the best things that happen uh, happen without you knowing about them at all. Um, and um, our job is to create a framework in which others can come up with brilliant ideas like that um, and then execute them. And uh, we should be, uh, ours in a sense is a, um, a, a supporting role uh, to create the framework rather than to come up with the ideas. So there's a, uh, in fact, I think I said in the speech that uh, you can't, um, you know, the thing about open data is we can't possibly come up with all the potential solutions that, it, that, that come up when you open up data. And um, you've just demonstrated that once again. Last question. Um, the, uh, the gentleman down here. 
Uh, John Wilden, Global Health Futures. Matt, it sounds as though you and I are uh, uh, <coughs> both from uh, the Nottingham area. And I, the question, I, I, I agree with you that automate and humanize is very important. And you would think that healthcare and education would be two of the main areas where there would be most to gain. And yet, in this country at the moment, as a retired neurosurgeon, I've been talking to a lot of young doctors recently, there is a lot of demoralization. The realization that, uh, yes, they are working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but they can't pro pro provide the sort of seven-day service that the uh, government is suggesting. And the reason for this is that actually, when you take good innovation, such as MRI scans, which this country, I have to say, was still trying to decide whether it was going to use it when I was over in America and Reagan was saying that every MRI scan should be within 24 miles of you know, every, everybody in the USA. We still have MRI scans, for example, that are just locked up at night and just not used. So we're not using the technology that we actually have at our disposal right now in lots of hospitals all over the country because we have not got the humanization bit right. And I mean, there are lots of examples of this. And I just wonder whether in government, at the center of government, uh, you have got this problem in your heads and what you're going to do to resolve it in your hearts. Well, uh, that's quite a big question. Um, the, um, um, ultimately, uh, there is a huge amount of technological advance um, within government and public services too. I mean, I've spoken mostly about the impact in the wider economy. Um, but in terms of educational technology, in terms of using technology in health, um, and in direct application of technology, um, and at this point, I always used to use the example of voter registration. Um, <laughs> and almost all the time, it works. Um, and the, um, but the... Um, um, but the, the truth is that the government and the public service needs to catch up with um, all of this as well. Uh, and in many cases it is, and there are exciting projects happening. But part of my call to arms is that there is a huge opportunity out here. There are challenges that it brings. We've got to face up to the challenges and make sure that we bring people along with us. We can't ignore them. But ultimately it is worth facing up to those challenges because the opportunities are much greater. And just as that is my approach to the, um, to the wider economy, that's exactly the approach that I take to public service reform as well. Thank you very much. It's been very stimulating questions, and I'm very grateful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Secondly, you'll also see an invitation to a lecture by Lord Chansky, our chairman. Uh, Matt has managed to go through a whole lecture without mentioning the European Union, for which we're very grateful. Uh, but if you do need to top up, then uh, come next Wednesday to uh, uh, hear uh, his thoughts on that at, uh, at Moody. Uh, but can we thank both uh, Bloomberg, but particularly Matt, for such a wonderful speech. And